That's it. That has music to it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Duly made it. Very special. I like I like Chad's comments earlier and where he said it's all Mike Myers' fault. So we a common thing or yeah, all this transition is all my fault. <laughs> all right, so you should be loaded. <coughs> okay, all right. We're live. You should be loaded. I'll check it real quick, Andy. <laughs> Sounds like we're live. <laughs> you can't miss that laugh. <laughs> we are indeed. Okay. We're good to go. All right, it's seven o'clock. We'll get started. Could you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silent reflection. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Roberts, should you please call the roll? Mr. Smeltzer. Here. Mr. Boat. Here. Mr. Hoffman. Here. Mr. Kimmer. Here. Mr. Myers. Here. Everybody's here tonight. Don't have anybody except for our principals and everybody else online, but have all board members present. That's good. All right. We've had the minutes. we able to look over them. Uh, any questions or comments on the minutes from last meeting? If not, need a motion to approve. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. Can I get a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Myers. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Mr. Boat? Yes. Mr. Kimmer? Yes. Motion passes. Moves us to 1.6. Adjustments to the agenda. Any adjustments? No adjustments at this time. Okay. Moves on to recognition of visitors, which we do not have either. And number three, principal's reports. Mr. Belleville. Uh, as always, uh, we try to have principals once a month and uh, appreciate the principals taking time to be here this evening. Uh, we'll uh, let them run through uh, things going on through buildings as we wrap up the last week of school here. So we'll start with Mr. McPhail. Uh, if you can give us an update on the high school. Thanks, Mr. Belleville. I have uh, just four things tonight. Uh, first of all, I wanted to give the board uh, a quick update on AP testing. Uh, AP was one of the areas that uh, you know, the college board did continue with the AP testing program. It was significantly altered. Those tests were only uh, short 45 minute tests. So they were very condensed and abbreviated. Um, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in, in uh, social media and in the press about some of the problems that have uh, that schools and, and students have incurred while trying to take these tests, uh, particularly with submitting them. So, but that's the bad news. The good news is that really hasn't impacted us that much. We had one student that, um, ironically, he was there, there's there were two parts to the test. In between parts, he was changing seats at his house, dropped his Chromebook, uh, messed his Chromebook up. He was able to get it working. He took the second part of the test but when he tried to submit it, it wouldn't submit. So uh, that was really our only incident. Uh, so, uh, you know, we were pretty pretty fortunate that we were able to get through that. Mr. Destadio headed up the, the AP testing program for us here at the high school, and he's extremely thorough, did an outstanding job. Students had more than, than all the information they needed to be successful. And, you know, I think the, the results bore that out in terms of us being able to, to finish those tests. We have two left. We have one student that's going to take uh, an AP test this week in psychology. 
and another, uh, the same student actually in macroeconomics. So um, if you see information about AP testing not going well, um, it was far from perfect, but we were able to get our students tested and tests submitted successfully. So uh, we were pleased with that. Um, just a quick up, up, update on our Chromebook turn in. We had a slow week last week. We only had total 93 students turn in materials at the, during, during the week last week. We did have a pretty successful day today though, uh, 94 total. Uh, when I came in from, uh, checked out in the hallway there before I came in to get ready for the meeting and we had 94. So we're about uh, one third of the way to our, our uh, total collection objective. And, um, you know, pretty optimistic that as the week goes on, the students have finished up their work now and all that work's been turned in. So uh, we feel like we're gonna probably be much more, much busier this week in getting that stuff back in. Uh, just a quick uh, kind of uh, closing comment, parting shot as far as our distance learning program and, and uh, what had occurred with that. We really feel like uh, we had a successful flurry here right at the end of the year. There were some issues, you know, middle way through um, the quarter a lot of students weren't doing a lot of work and uh, teachers were having to work very hard to try to keep them motivated. But here at the end of last week or so, we did see a significant uptick in that activity and uh, assignments came in. I just had a conversation with Mr. Sefton in particular about a half an hour ago and he was talking about how, you know, he had upwards of 75, 85, 90% of his students had had uh, kicked it in and, you know, gotten work done at a, at a pretty positive level. So I'll be anxious to see final stats on that, but it, it seems like from the conversations that I've had that we did have a positive uptick here the last week and a half or so of the quarter. And then obviously the thing that's um, that we're most focused on right now is final details and, and uh, getting everything ready to go, double, triple checking on all of the aspects of our parade this Saturday and you know our graduation activities that were going to be taking place over the next couple of weeks. I'm, uh, I'm pretty optimistic that this is going to come off well. I think it's going to be an exciting day Saturday. It looks like the forecast looks positive and um, we're excited about it. I think we've, I think we're going to have a good day. And I'm also excited about the, the video graduation ceremony. I'm working out some notes and details today, just in terms of how the, you know, the small changes that you've got to put into the process to, to make it professional. Uh, doing it in a, in a video format, and um, I think we've got a chance to have a pretty a pretty positive product with that as well. So fingers are crossed, and um, we're going to proceed with caution. And and uh, but but I think we're we're in pretty good position. <clears throat> Questions for Mr. McPhail. Mr. McPhail, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll go to uh, Mrs. Hahn. Hi. Good evening. I would like to uh, have a special thank you to uh, the Board of Education and Mr. Belleville for uh, your continued support and guidance through this spring. Um, also, a thank you to our families in the district. Um, spoke, I've spoken with many families over the phone and uh, during our Chromebook turn in and uh, um, parents and family members have just gone above and beyond to, uh, you know, help their children during this difficult time. Um, now, with that, with that being said, they are definitely happy to turn those Chromebooks in. Um, but, uh, you know, I'd also like to thank the teachers. Um, I've heard a lot of positive comments about our teacher, about our teachers and our support staff and all of the help that they have given um, our students as well. Um, and they volunteered at, at food distribution and uh, many of them are helping with Chromebook collection as well. So I, I really appreciate all of their efforts. Um, and then finally, you know, for our students, I feel like the students have definitely, they, they've learned to be a different type of learner this spring. Um, they've had to overcome many obstacles that um, they wouldn't have had to face um, with, without this type of, you know, the COVID-19 situation that we've all dealt with. So, um, you know, they've learned to, to be flexible. Um, they've definitely learned to communicate differently uh, via Google Meets and in relying on email. Um, you know, they're, they're, I'm sure they're better problem solvers and uh, they've learned time management. Um, so, um, you know, I'm very proud of them and the work that they've done. Um, our Chromebook collection um, definitely had an uptick today. Um, as of last Friday, we had 186 Chromebooks collected. Um, however, today, 
we hit triple digits at the middle school. So we had well over 100 um, collected uh, when I last checked before getting ready for the meeting. So um, I'd also like to talk or I'd also like to thank Andy Doss and his team uh, for their efforts in, in the, that Chromebook collection. We definitely wouldn't have been able to, you know, get that roll in without their help. Um, recently at the middle school, we um, were able to have 48 students inducted into the Junior National Honor Society, 14 eighth graders, 34 seventh graders, um, you know, certificates and letters went home, uh, mailed home to students, um, you know, as, as they're coming in to turn their Chromebooks in, I'm trying to, you know, reach out to them and let them know how, you know, I wish we could have done something in person. However, obviously that's not possible, but, you know, congratulations to those 48 students. Um, as we are uh, collecting Chromebooks, we're also trying to um, hand out our end of the year awards for students as well. Um, many of them uh, going out to students who might be most outstanding in a classroom or perhaps they were most improved in their classroom. And I total up the amount of overall end of year awards, also those awards going out to student council members. And we have 419 end of year awards going out to our middle school students. So, um, you know, congratulations to them. Um, just a couple of other things kind of moving towards looking at next year as well. Um, you know, we have our middle school schedule pretty well finalized and we actually began um, looking at hand scheduling some students today. Um, and uh, our, our building leadership team um, as well as I'm sure the other buildings as well have determined their goals for next year for, um, you know, our, our math and literacy and our SEL goals. So, um, you know, as we close down this year, um, you know, it's a definitely a different type of closure, but, you know, we're definitely looking forward to next year and what that's going to look like. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. Appreciate that update. Uh, we'll go to Ms. Rice, who we also want to wish happy birthday to today. Uh, happy, birthday. happy birthday. Thank you. Um, so much like everyone else, we're working on wrapping up the end of the year here at Bremen. Our goal as a staff was to end the year strong, and I feel like that we really did do that. Um, We've been working on collecting and distributing student materials last week and again this week. We ended Friday with about 47% of our Chromebooks turned back in, which was um, a strong number. Um, we've been collecting about 30 to 40 a night and we were at that thir just about that 30 again tonight. So if we continue that trend, we should be pretty close to having most of them by um, Wednesday or Thursday of this week. Um, we held our digit, uh, right to read week and we did that digitally. I did send out and share that with the board so that you guys could see what we do with that. Not nearly as fun to do it, uh, on a computer as what we do in person, but definitely we're excited to still be able to offer the students the opportunity to do that. And it was great to have the high school baseball team participate with us in that project, um, there a week or so ago. Uh, I collected videos and pictures and songs for our fourth grade clap out. And with the help of Mr. Thompson, um, Mrs. Thompson's husband, we were able to put that together and get it sent out to our families. Uh, well received by our families, you know, something that's such an important tradition for our fourth graders. So being able to uphold that, even if we had to do it digitally instead of in person. And the last thing going out this year, um, you know, our students were trying to, our teachers were trying to find a way to engage our students, um, you know, to, to wrap up the year after they turned in their Chromebooks and whatnot. So there's a very popular children's book out there called Flat Stanley. And so we have a lot of flat teachers floating around in our community. Here's Mrs. Venerick joining us tonight for the board meeting. Um, so uh, they sent these out to their students and the flat teachers have been all over our community. Um, they've had beds built for them. They've been on walks and bike rides and Mrs. Vendrick even had a bath. So it has been exciting to see our students engaged in that project. Um, you know, just having that final closure with their teachers that they couldn't do in person. 
Okay. Any questions for Mr. Rice? Thank you, Mr. Rice. Appreciate that update. And the uh, fourth grade clap out video was fantastic. Really enjoyed that. So thank you for putting that together for us. Thank you. And you. we'll finish up with uh, Mr. Myers. Thank you, uh, Mr. Belleville and the board for the opportunity to, to talk to you this evening. Uh, just going to echo some of the thing, same things you've already heard uh, from the other administrators. Lots of positive comments throughout the, the whole process. Uh, not only with uh, food collection, but also with the uh, Chromebook uh, turn in and the personal belongings pickup. Uh, parents have been very complimentary, uh, not only of uh, the individual schools, but just the district as a whole. Um, you know, Don said it last night when we were uh, preparing for the uh, state of the schools that, you know, the, the, the parents know that we have their backs uh, in this district. And that's very, very important. Uh, as we keep moving forward and, you know, cause this isn't over yet. You know, we still have lots of planning to do for next year. Uh, as far as like the Chromebook uh, collection, uh, we, we hit 53 tonight, which is pretty steady for us. We had our first night, we had 12. Uh, we've attributed to that, attributed the uh, increase to uh, putting Jack's and a gorilla costume and a sign out in front of the school. So that seems like that helped. No, I'm just kidding about that part. We didn't actually do that. Um, Lots of uh, obviously uh, shuffling of staff this year uh, coming coming forward. Uh, Mrs. Miller and I met today to talk about that a little bit. Uh, lots of planning that's going to take place there, not only to wrap up this school year, uh, but we're already thinking about next school year as far as schedules and things like that. Um, we also have a clap out video that will be coming, uh, you know, probably next week. Our parents are finishing up. Uh, as they turn uh, in their Chromebooks to take pic they're taking pictures in front of our signboard in the school uh, that has the uh, the different sayings on it. Uh, and I've I've seen the Bremen video. It is awesome, and that's going to be hard to live up to, but uh, uh, we'll give it a shot. Um, again, other than wrapping up the school year, uh, uh, on a lighter side, uh, a few weeks ago, or maybe a few months ago at this point, I shared with the board. You know, there's things that happen at the elementary school that you probably don't know about. One of those things is swish, uh, where the kids, uh, you know, have to swish around the fluoride uh, rinse in their mouth and then they have to spit that out on a cup. Uh, that's something that uh, uh, not all the kids really uh, look forward to doing that just because of the, uh, you know, the, the process of it. Well, a, a monumental decision, and I, uh, and I guess this was made by the state of Ohio, the company that makes Swish is no longer making that powder. We mix that together for our kids. So Swish is going away. Uh, I've had parents uh, jumping up for, and down for joy, teachers doing the same, and lots of kids that are probably not going to miss the mint tasting Swish that they had to deal with on a regular basis on Wednesday. So Again, on the lighter side, you know, things again that uh, happen at the elementaries that you probably didn't know about. Uh, so I wanted to give you a, an update on SWISH, but uh, lots lots to look forward to uh, moving forward. Uh, looking forward to uh, working with Mrs. Miller uh, in her uh, new role here as a principal at Pleasantville. Again, we started that today and look forward to that in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Any questions? Quick question for yes. Mike and for Don, actually. How did the K through second, third graders do with the Chromebooks? I've, I've not really heard how well they performed with the Chromebooks. So I found that the students were pretty engaged for the most part. Um, a key factor was parents being able to be home with them. Um, you know, hindsight, if we were able to do this over again, or if we have to think about doing this in the fall, I think it would be nice to offer parents some classes on how to use Google Classroom, um, some sessions on that, because I think that was probably the biggest hurdle, the parents not knowing how to navigate that with their students. And, you know, K through two, they need a lot of extra support being able to do those kinds of things. Yeah. The, the teachers ended up doing a lot of in-service with parents on how to use that. You know, the two things there, one is the utilization of the technology by the kids. Uh, you know, I would say that we were pleasantly surprised, one, by the number of kids that had internet, we were worried about that. And what we're finding is even if the kids did not have internet or the parents didn't ha did not have internet, they were, you know, 
getting with neighbors to use Wi-Fi signals and things like that. So again, that's just a testament uh, to cooperation in the district. The other component on that is we have not, I'm glad to say, had any Chromebooks come back in pieces yet. We were worried about that a little bit, uh, you know, because uh, kids, uh, you know, going from point A to point B anywhere, whether it's at school or at home, uh, when you're younger like that, it's uh, it's a little bit more difficult. In fact, we had a uh, uh, the first night we had a parent that uh, turned in a Chromebook and handed it to one of us, and we sort of fumbled it. And the parent said, "Oh, I gave it to you. If it's broke, it's your fault." Type thing. So that was sort of a, mo a moment of levity. But uh, we are very pleased that they're coming back in one piece and not in multiple pieces, because that was a very big concern for everybody. Thank you. Mike, you mentioned it just there, but this is to all of you. Going off of uh, the internet um, question, was there any, in any of the schools, did we have any problems with, you know, people not either having internet or not good internet or where they fell behind or anything like that um, in any of the schools? Mr. Belleville, you know, the, sent out one of the messages where he asked parents if they did not uh, have internet and they could not get to the school. Because remember, they could actually come to the schools and borrow our uh, Wi-Fi signal to uh, download material. Uh, at my building, I had one parent call and said that they both couldn't, they both did not have internet and they couldn't get to the school. And I shared, I think I shared with you at the previous board meeting that that was basically because the, her kindergartner was utilizing all the mom's hotspot data to play games on their Chromebook because they hadn't really received any internet assignments yet. So, but I had one parent that said they could not get internet service either at home or by way of coming through uh, and using the Wi-Fi at the school. We had two families. Um, they actually, uh, it would be one family, just two sections of household um, that had the similar issue. So they did call in and get some alternative assignments that they could do uh, via other means than the internet. But other than that, we did early on have one fam family say they didn't have internet, but it turned out the kid was doing all of her work online. So um, that was not an issue like they thought it was. And I think in the middle school, um, I, I don't have an actual number as far as parents who um, don't have actual internet. But I think as as families have been bringing them in, Mr. Doss asks the question whether they have reliable internet. And for the most part, they do. Um, if they don't have reliable internet, they're, they're working from a hotspot. Um, and some, like Mr. Uh, Myers mentioned, have gone to even a neighbor's um, or to maybe a family member's house um, in order to, you know, get the work done. So I think overwhelmingly at the middle school, uh, we've had, you know, a lot of good success with the, with uh, the internet. Yeah, I would, I would agree with Mrs. Hahn at the high school. You know, we've got an advantage with most of the high school students that they have the ability to drive. So, you know, accessing um, the school Wi-Fi when necessary was, was a positive option. And also the, the, um, you know, through, through some of our staff members emailing work to um, Christy and having her, you know, print that work off and make hard copies for the students. I think that was a big help as well. So I don't, I don't think that, I mean, there were, there were a few small challenges, but I, I thought we were able to negotiate those pretty well. Early on, we tried to survey students to check on internet. And at that time, it, it seemed like we were running about 93% of our students said that they had internet or had access to internet. Uh, that was very, very early on in the closure. Um, so uh, we're, we are surveying now to try to get a more definitive number as they turn in Chromebooks. Uh, Mr. Doss and uh, his crew are asking that question as people turn them in so that we have a little bit better idea exactly what the coverage is, what percentage of our students have it, uh, and preparations for next year. Um, we very early on also, uh, Mr. Doss, Mr. Fouracre, uh, Mr. Kovacs put together a lot of training videos and training slides on how to use different parts of Google, Google Classroom, how to 
download and work materials offline. And all of those are posted on our website under the parents tab. Uh, and it's, you know, like Ms. Rice said, uh, we definitely need to try to do as much professional development as we can. Uh, maybe we probably need to advertise that better. We sent a call out very early on that those training slides and directions and videos were, were posted there, but it's probably in hindsight something we should have kind of reinforced multiple times. But, uh, uh, you know, that definitely our, our teachers have gone above and beyond trying to provide that support to parents on how to how to incorporate things and use them properly. So, um, you know, all told, it you know, I think it's probably gone as well as it could. Uh, if we hit if we hit into August and are still using it, we've definitely learned some lessons and some things we can fine tune. So. <clears throat> Mr. Bill, I'm sure I'm glad we moved forward with the Chromebooks. I'm sure, where would we be? Oh, That's I right. mean, you know, and yes, we're going to have band-aids, and, and some might come back in pieces. But, you know, where would we be? Yeah, you know? We're in the school district right now. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, no, we're extremely blessed. Uh, mm -hmm. Spoke about it. Um, our state of schools would be Friday night, and that's one of the topics we definitely want to touch on. Uh, we're extremely blessed. Our community, you know, provides that permanent improvement levy that helped bring the one-to-one -one initiative uh, to the district, as well as you know, we made we made the determination. I guess it's been two years ago now that uh, you know we were about a year ahead of the original forestry plan, but with the death of the ash trees that were falling on the cross-country course and the safety issues that. You know, we moved forward with going ahead with the forestry plan that was laid out many years ago and mm -hmm. and utilizing our resources mm -hmm. as well as the one as the permanent improvement levy to to uh, you know pay for that one-to-one -one technology and uh, yeah it, oh. with, without a doubt we we would have been in a bad shape without it yeah, yeah. all right We're ready to move on thank you to the principals thank you All right, moves us on to section four, consent agenda section uh, 4.1 is the workshops and conferences, which I believe we can skip over. I'll touch on that later during my updates. Uh, it's been blank for the past couple yeah. meetings, and it'll continue to be blank for the immediate future, and I'll explain more a little bit later. All right, All right so moves us to 4.2 financial <coughs> items. Uh, Mrs. Roberts? Hi, okay, so a few quick things. This financial item, actually, I'm going to be pretty brief with it because this is um, our financial summary for the month of April. And this will really tie into the forecast that I'm gonna present later. So I'm gonna run through pieces of this, but I think that, you know, I'm obviously gonna spend a lot more time on the forecast because this is really just focused on one month. So overall, if you look at the beginning of our summary, for the month of April, our revenues increased by $1 million or 5% to last year. Um, the biggest things is that we have now collected all of our prop majority of property tax and income tax. Um, income tax at this point has been 100% received for the year. Um, it was higher than our last forecast of $35,000 higher, $35, higher than our last forecast. And it was up almost 8% to last year or $380,000. So that's really where we're seeing that revenue come in um, overall for the month. If we look at expenditures, this is actually interesting. So our expenditures decreased by $267,000 or a little over 1% to last year. Um, benefits were up, which this is what we have seen. So no major changes here. This is really due to our insurance costs. Purchase services decreased by $20,000 or almost 1% for the month. This was actually the one that I was probably the most surprised in. I expected to see a much larger decrease here with all the buildings and everything more or less being closed. Um, and those decreases really didn't come to fruition. So um, we're trending in line to be with the projection and to be with where we were for the year, but I just expected to see it decrease a little bit more for the month, um, considering it was the first time that we had the full month of being closed for COVID-19. Um, supplies and capital decreased by six. Courtney, can I ask a question right there? Sure. With the trend in utilities, you know, not coming down like we expected, is that partly because of the 
baseline that they establish whenever they look at your uh, capacity usage, like on max days and things like that? Do you know? Um, you know what? I, I, that's a good question. I actually don't know the exact piece of it. I'll actually go back and look at that because the one piece that we really thought was the electric that we thought would come down and we thought, you know, once like the air wasn't on every day and all that, that we would see pieces of that. Um, and we just didn't see that, but that we'll go back and see. I don't think that's the case. Um, and actually speaking with some other treasurers in, in the county, um, they're seeing some of the same thing. So everybody kind of thought that it would come down a lot and nobody's really seeing, you know, major decreases here. But I'll go back Thank and you. look at that. Um, I will say supplies saw a 64,000 or 15% decrease. Um, we only spent about $4,000 here for the month and we had been spending about $40,000 a month. So really just with being closed, we really, and we'll talk more about this as well later, but really, you know, not having a lot of orders out there for supplies, um, our paper purchases and everything, all of that has gone down. So that's definitely good to see. And then the other piece of this is that, um, our transfers out. So this is the 0.75% of income tax. This year it happened in May. Last year it happened like one of the very first days in May. Last year it happened at the end of April. So it's not necessarily a decrease. It's just a shift in the month. Um, and then overall, we have been trending higher uh, in our revenues to expenditures, which is great as we go into the end of the year. Closing out April, our revenue was exceeding expenditures by a little over $3 million. Again, that's due to the property tax collections, the closures. Um, and then we'll obviously talk more about this, but that will be offset by being cut $338,000 um, with our last three payments of state funding. So I'm very, very, very happy that coming out of April, we are 3.1 million to the good. Um, and I'll talk more about that, obviously, when I go through the forecast, but that is, an, is really helping us kind of help close out the year. The other thing to keep in mind is why that sounds like a lot Um Basically, what's happening is we have received almost all of our revenue other than state funding for the year. So our major sources of revenue, so our taxes, our income tax, wellness funds, all of that has already been received. So we essentially now have to live off of that for the next few months. So that's why that looks like it's pretty high. Um, but that's really just because it's the influx of revenue. And then we'll see that trickle off for the end of the year. So at the end of April, our cash balance is at $13.8 million. The October forecast has the end of the year coming at 10.7 million. Um, and then, like I said, the cash balances will decrease as we get into the May forecast. Um, those are our major pieces for April. Um, our expenditures are pretty much in line as far as a percent to the year as to where we should be at this point. So I'm feeling good as to where they're sitting um, as well as revenue. I, you know, I feel like it's actually been a lot of the same um, same kind of messages that I've been giving the past few months. So obviously we will definitely talk about some shifts. We'll definitely talk about where the year is going to end and then where I foresee 2021 coming in when I go through the forecast. But for the month of April, we are um, coming out of at 3.1 million ahead. So that is good because that will set us up for the balance of the year. Any questions on that piece of it? I know I breezed through that a little bit because I do want to spend a lot of time on the May forecast, which Instead of focusing just on one month, it'll make more sense to focus on the total year. But more than happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Moves us on to the approval. I need a motion to approve the consent agenda items as they were presented. Moved by Mr. Boat. Can I get a second? Second, Mr. Boat. Second by Mr. Kemmer. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Motion passes. Moves us to number five, new business section. 5.1, leave of absence. Motion to approve a two year leave of absence for Martha Icorn, effective at the beginning of the 2021 school year through the end of the 2021 2022 school year. Per the negotiated agreement, teachers are entitled to a leave of absence for up to two years. Uh, Mrs. Eichhorn has a youngster at home and another on the way, and uh, she's 
wanting to stay home and be a mom for a couple of years uh, as those as those children navigate their adolescence there. So uh, you know, Martha's done incredible work for us, first as a tutor at Pleasantville and uh, as a kindergarten teacher at Freeman. And so I, I would recommend we approve that leave of absence. Questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So moved. <laughs> moved by Mr. Myers. I will second. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Phillips. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Motion passes. Moves us to 5.2. Motion to approve the resignation of Mackenzie Smith as tutor for the 2021 school year effective immediately. Uh, we're going to be transitioning Mackenzie to the classroom. So in order to issue her a, a contract for that, uh, she has to resign her current position. So I would recommend we approve that so we can put her in a classroom. All right. So motion. Motion by Mr. Bo. Can I get a second? Second, Mr. President. Second by Mr. Kemmer. Mrs. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 5.3. Motion to accept the resignation of Marsha Miller as teacher effective July 31st, 2020. Kind of the same thing as Mackenzie. We have bigger and better things for Mrs. Miller, so uh, we needed her to resign her teaching position before we could make those moves. So I would recommend that we approve. Need a motion. So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Kemmer. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Second by Mr. Hoffman. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Kemmer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Bo. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Motion passes. Moves us to 5.4 transfers. Motion to approve transfers as presented. Uh, going into next year, uh, we are extremely worried about learning gaps and achievements with our students. And uh, as we look at how things are going to roll out in August, uh, one of the groups I'm most concerned about are fourth grade students heading into fifth grade. That is always a difficult time uh, for a variety of reasons. A, going to the middle school, fifth graders tend to be a little intimidated, uh, being in a, in a building with eighth graders. Uh, additionally, uh, you know, at that age, there's hormones involved and everything that goes into being a middle schooler. And then on top of that, we have kids coming from two different elementary schools that, you know, being around new people, new friends, those type of things. And then the final layer of that now is with this closure, uh, we know that there are going to be learning gaps. And as we start the school year, teachers are going to have to reach back down to the level below them to get into those learning standards to help fill the gap and bring the kids back up to speed. So all those factors combined really worried about fifth grade for next year. So I've asked Ms. Rice to uh, move to the middle school as assistant principal to be a resource for teachers. Her content knowledge of the fourth grade standards is outstanding. Uh, I think she'll be an invaluable resource to the staff to help fill those gaps as, as the kids come over. Uh, for at least half the students, it'll be a familiar face, someone that they know. Uh, uh, that they can you know, lean on for help. And uh, I, I, I really think for the kids in the building, it's, it'd just be a really good move for us. So I, I would recommend that we transfer Ms. Rice from principal of Bremen Elementary to assistant principal at Rushville Middle School. In conjunction with that, the second population that I'm really concerned about that, it, that is always a difficult population for us is the behavior unit that we house at Bremen Elementary School. Uh, again, many of the same factors, we know those kids are going to have gaps in their learning, and those, those things tend to cause frustration with those students, which increases behaviors and those type of things. Uh, no offense to Ms. Rice, but Mr. Ripple has a certain presence about him when he, you know, just physical stature, uh, he intimidates most of us when he walks in the room. So uh, with some of those behavior kids, when, when he steps into a room, it commands a little bit of attention there, 
and we feel like his presence and uh, his ability to, to relate with kids, he has an extensive background as a dean of students and working with some troubled kids that we think his presence is going to help that student population. So all the way around, I think that, I think that these are two transfers that could prove invaluable for teachers and students. And I appreciate uh, Ms. Rice and Mr. Ripple. Uh, you know, I've had conversations with both of them, and uh, they, they are willing to make those moves for the betterment of the students and the staffs and the district. So I would recommend we transfer those two individuals. Any other questions, comments? <clears throat> All right, need a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mr. Myers. I will second. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Mr. Boat? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Kimmerer? Yes. Motion passes. Thanks, John. Thank you, Ms. Rice. Appreciate that. Uh, on this five, five. Yep, 5.5 five is more transfers. Go ahead, Mr. Yep. Uh, we have Ms. Hockman requesting to go from kindergarten to Pleasantville third grade. That is to fill Cindy Landis's position. Uh, Cindy went to art for the elementary schools. Uh, Trisha Denny uh, moving into fifth grade math. If you remember, Stephanie McCoy went from fifth grade math to the technology position. Uh, she, where she's working on a master's degree in that area. And uh, Ms. Denny, as you recall, uh, incredibly gifted math teacher at our seventh grade level. And when we transitioned from block scheduling to more traditional periods, uh, Ms. Denny voluntarily moved to the art. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to get her back into the math department. So we appreciate her making that move. And then with uh, Ms. Miller, Trans, uh, transferring to the principalship at Pleasantville Elementary. Uh, that opened up a second grade spot at Pleasantville and Carrie Hammock had requested to make the move from kindergarten to second grade. So I would recommend we make those three transfers as well. Any questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So move, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Mr. Boat. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Uh, Mr. Kimmerer. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Motion passes. Moves us to 5.6. Motion to approve a two-year administrator contract for Marsha Miller as Pleasantville Elementary Principal, effective August 1st, 2020. Salary Schedule B, Group 4, Step 1. I uh, want to start off by thanking uh, everyone that served on the interview committee. Uh, Mr. Boat and Mr. Myers were on that committee as well, so they can feel free to jump in here with any comments. But a uh, uh, very extensive search. We had a deep pool of applicants, uh, uh, held, held a first round of interviews, and uh, felt the need for a second round because we had two people that were just extremely highly qualified. After the second round of interviews, it became pretty clear uh, that Ms. Miller was the person for the job. Uh, she really stood out in that second interview and had a good vision for what she wanted to do with the position and the building and the leadership. And uh, it just it, it became crystal clear to the committee after the second round of interviews and uh, couldn't be more proud to uh, see somebody internally elevate to a position. Uh, it's a lot of years of hard work and dedication and uh, uh, extremely proud of the work that Ms. Miller has put in. And uh, you know, she worked hard to get to this spot, so we're excited, excited to bring her on board to the administrative team, and and uh, very eager to see what she's going to do in that position. So, uh, very happy about that. And Miss Miller, anything you'd like to uh, add? Judy. Oh. Still muted. No, she, no, yeah. she's still muted, Marcia. You're muted, Marcia. Okay. There you go. How's that? Are we good? Okay. Um, I am just uh, want to thank everyone again uh, that was a part of the inter interview committee. I know it was a time consuming thing, and I am thrilled to be able to step into the role of principal at Pleasantville. 
and it's an amazing building um, full of amazing staff. Uh, I have big shoes to fill for sure um, because Mr. Myers, as you know, has been um, an amazing administrator in our district and quite a pillar in our communities. And I am eager to do what I can to step in and um, continue a lot of the same things that he's been doing because um, there's a lot that's working well and there's no need to change what works well. Um, and I'm super excited to uh, make some changes as well as we see things that come up that need to be adjusted or tweaked. Um, I did wanna say as well, I, Flat Mrs. Miller is here too. Uh, Flat Mrs. Miller traveled to all of my classroom students, <laughs> and I actually at some point maybe need to share some of the pictures. I had some very creative students who took me bike riding, and they got those little miniature football helmets, and they stuck it on my head so that I was safely riding the bike with them, um, and so we know some of our safety lessons are also uh, sticking with the kids as well. Um, but I am, I am so excited to take on this new adventure and um, I want to thank everyone once again um, and I am so proud uh, again and continue to be proud uh, to be a Falcon. Questions or comments? Nothing except congratulations, Marcia. You worked hard for that. And you earned thank it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that very much. Anyone else? All right, else? Need a motion to approve. So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Kimmer, seconded by Mr. Boat and Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. yes. Motion passes. Congratulations. Good job, Marshall. Congratulations. Move on to 5.7. Motion to approve a two-year teacher contract for Mackenzie Smith as Pleasantville first grade teacher beginning 2020-2021 school year. One year of experience, B degree on the teacher salary schedule, pending verification of all application and license materials. I want to add that with all of our hires, uh, we they were all willing to attend virtually. Uh, I was a little worried about having so many people up on the screen. Uh, plus, I, you know, I know how important it is to the Board of Education to welcome people to the district uh, and make that face-to-face -face contact and, and formally welcome them. So we have told all the teachers that once we get back to that point where we can have people attend the meetings, that we'll invite them at that point so that you know the board can officially welcome them to the district. So uh, that's why the teachers are here. They were all more than willing to be here and wanted to be here, but I, I wanted to do that in person at some point. So uh, that's why they're not here. So uh, we'll start with Mackenzie Smith going to uh, first grade at Pleasantville. Just she's done a tremendous job as tutor. Uh, and I guess I, Mike, I should have uh, asked if you had anything you wanted to add to Miss Miller and. I'll ask you now about uh, uh, Mackenzie Smith. Anything you want to add? You're muted, Mike. Mike, you're muted. Push a little bit there. There you go. Yeah. Sorry about that. Hit it about six times. Wouldn't work. Yeah, I'm a uh, couple things there, you know, with uh, Marsha, um, you know, Marsha, uh, even going back to her internship, you know, we've had a good relationship. Uh, we've talked about scheduling a lot. Uh, she's a go to person in the building. If there's something that, uh, you know, I need to, to analyze critically, she's always been somebody that I can ask and bounce ideas off of. So she she's ready. She's ready for the position. And, and I'm excited to see where Pleasantville goes. Uh, down the road. As far as uh, Mackenzie, uh, again, she has, uh, you know, she did some of her student uh, teaching experiences uh, here at Pleasantville in first grade with Mrs. Squires. Uh, so she's been uh, working under one of the best. Uh, so I'm looking forward uh, to seeing her as well and how she uh, continues to grow as an educator. Uh, but she's, you know, very much impressive, even at this point in her young career. Motion to approve. 
So moved. Moved by Mr. Myers. Can I get a second? I will second. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 5.8. Motion to approve a one-year teacher contract for Lauren Hong as Pleasantville kindergarten teacher beginning 2020-2021 school year. Zero years of experience, B degree on the teacher salary schedule, pending verification of all application and license materials. Uh, this would be to fill Lindsay Hockman's spot, who's going to third grade. Uh, Lauren just did tremendous work for us as the elementary art teacher stepped in uh, there in the second semester and really performed admirably. And uh, over break has done some amazing things with the kids virtually with art and uh, we knew, we knew pretty quickly. She had done her student teaching with us and then jumped into this spot. We, we knew pretty quickly that she's a keeper, I, a fantastic educator. So we're, we're very lucky that uh, we have a spot coming open and, and we can keep her in the fold. So uh, this is one of, those, one of those hires that you look back 20, 30 years from now and you go, hi, it was a good one. So uh, very happy to have her on board. Any questions, comments? In motion to approve. So move, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Boat. Can I get a second? Second, Mr. President. Second by Mr. Kimmer. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Motion, motion passes. Excuse me. Uh, Ms. 5.9. Motion to approve a one-year teacher contract for Matthew Gregory as music teacher beginning 2020-2021 school year, zero years experience, B degree in tel teacher salary schedule, pending verification of all application and license materials. Uh, very excited to bring Mr. Gregory on board. Uh, recent graduate of The Ohio State University. Uh, very extensive background with choir and drama productions uh, through his student teaching and college career. And, uh, then on top of that was also a five-year member of the marching band at Ohio State. So a well-rounded uh, background. And when you talk to him, uh, his enthusiasm and his uh, passion for what he's doing is contagious. I mean, you, you can't sit in a room with him for long and not get fired up about what's going on around him. Uh, I know he's already been involved with a music booster meeting uh, last Wednesday, so met with that group, uh, has been in contact with uh, all of our music teachers in, in the district, and uh, I'm just hearing nothing but glowing returns. Uh, Mr. Turkey was kind enough to sit in on the interview process and uh, didn't ask any questions, just sat and listened. And uh, after all the interviews were over, I, I kind of said, well, what do you think? And he just kind of kind of chuckled and said, man, you've got, you've got a good one right there. Uh, so, you know, has Mr. Turkey a stamp of approval, which is which is very good. Uh, Mr. McPhail, Ms. Hahn set in on those interviews, um, and uh, they may want to add in on this one, but uh, I just really think we've got a high-quality individual that's going to do great things with the choir, and, and he's already showing a willingness uh, to assist with the band as well and lend his expertise there. So really excited to bring him on board. I think he's going to do great things. Matt, Tricia, any questions? Anything? Really don't have anything to add. Um, both of Matt's parents are both educators as well. So that's always an interesting dynamic. He's kind of, I think he's just kind of grown up around it. But uh, Matt is an extremely high energy person. So I think he's going to really be um, impactful to the programs. I agree. I uh, spoke with Mrs. Ritten today and she um, told me that she has spoken with Matt. Um, she said they spoke for about an hour and 15 minutes on the phone. And I've also um, talked with Mr. Savage and he's also um, talked with Matt as well. And they are both very excited to be work. Well, this is written says that she, you know, he's going to do extremely well. And Mr. Savage is very excited to work with him and very impressed. So um, I, I'm thrilled and I, and I can't wait to work with him at the middle school. Questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So moved, Mr. President. 
Moved by Mr. Hoffman. A second. <laughs> second by Mr. Boat. <clears throat> Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Motion passes. Moves us to 5.10. Motion to approve a one-year teacher contract for Emily Cup as Raymond Kindergarten teacher beginning 2020-2021 school year, one-year experience, and degree on teacher salary schedule, pending verification of all application and license materials. Uh, you always, uh, when you have staff members that email you and say, hey, I know a person, you might want to talk to them. That always, you know, piques your interest and, and you listen to that. And uh, Hannah Landis had contacted me and said, I have a friend who I went to school with that's looking for a job. I think she'd be great here. Uh, then it turns out Lauren Hahn also went to school with her. Uh, so Mr. Myers and I interviewed uh, Ms. Cup, and uh, kind of a common thing you'll hear tonight, it didn't take real long in that conversation to realize she's a lot smarter about elementary education than I am. Uh, and, that, I mean, that's normally not saying a whole lot, but she she's impressive. I mean, she's going to do extremely good things in the classroom. Uh, absolutely blew me away. Uh, she's she's going to be a, a great find for us. And uh, being able to assemble a team uh, that has longstanding connections already. You know, Hannah will be going into her second year as kindergarten teacher at Bremen and bringing Emily on board, somebody she knows. You know, that you start forming teams of young teachers and and really it provides stability long-term for the district. They have a great mentor down there, and Ms. Venrick, who, who can show them the ropes. And uh, so I'm excited about the team that's being built there and what's being done. So uh, really, really happy to be able to grab Emily. I've had two or three uh, superintendents around us have contacted me over the weekend. Uh, they tried to hire Ms. Hahn. This cup, and we'd already snatched them up. So uh, we're getting people there in high demand around us. So that's always good too. So, uh, Mr. Myers, anything you want to add to that? I was just going to add that uh, you know the way I term it is we have a lot of young rock stars when it comes to uh, their potential in education. So you know I'm I'm going to be seeing this from afar, but uh, obviously you know I'm still going to be involved in uh, different ways. Uh, but I'm excited to see, you know, the youth that we're getting in the district to go along with the the great vast uh, majority of our staff members who have a lot of uh, experience that can help guide our young teachers. But it, it, it's going to be exciting. Any other questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Kemmer. Can I get a second? I'll second. Second by Mr. Myers. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Motion passes. Moves us to 511. Motion to approve one year teacher contract for Christina Kearns as Bremen kindergarten teacher beginning 2020 2021 school year. Three years experience, B degree on teacher salary schedule, pending verification of application and license materials. When I first found out we were going to have three kindergarten openings and, and now a fourth, you really worry about, I mean, that, that's a critical period in education that, you know, that first step in kindergarten. And uh, to be able to walk away with one or two good ones when you need three at one time, you know, you count your blessings. But we need to play the lottery because we just hit it uh, to for your to find a Christy Kearns also out there. Uh, she's worked in the preschool here. You know, her husband Travis, a former uh, member of our staff at the high school. Um, I'll call Miss Rice here shortly. Miss Rice has worked with her uh, extensively, but uh, you know when you interview Christy again, uh, she has kids in the district. Her love and passion for Fairfield Union is unparalleled. Uh, she's uh, a falcon through and through and has exhibited that in the classroom already. So we, we know what we're getting out of her. But again, you look at a person that uh, really is going to bring a lot of energy, uh, a lot of uh, passion to the classroom. And 
just completely blown away and excited to be coming out of this process with the quality of people we were able to find. I, you know, we have some high quality teachers walking away uh, or stepping away for various reasons and we're able to fill it with equally talented teachers is, is a true blessing. So uh, excited to bring Christy on board and she's, I know she's gonna do amazing things as well. Uh, just a top notch educator. Uh, Ms. Rice. So when you talk about Christy Kearns, you talk about love, compassion, and caring. Um, she's been in our preschool for two years now, um, one year as an aide and one year as the lead teacher. And she's a part of this staff. She loves these students and you couldn't find a better fit. Thank you. Need a motion to approve? So move, Mr. President. Move Mr. Boat. Can I get a second? I will second. Mrs. Roberts. Sorry, Mr. Smeltzer, was that you who seconded? Yes, it was. Okay, sorry. Okay, Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. Moves us to 512. Motion to approve the resignation of Ryan Cheek as varsity assistant football coach effective immediately. I, I don't have a lot of information on his resignation outside of what he sent us. Um, I haven't been able to touch base with Coach Clark to, to see if there was a specific reason. Mr. McFell, do you know of any, any reasons behind that? I believe Coach Cheek had an opportunity to coach where he's going to be um, in the classroom next year. And so it was just an opportunity to kind of synchronize both teaching and coaching. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. Eight single. Definitely. Questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mr. Myers. Can I get a second? Second by Mr. Hoffman. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Motion passes. Moves us to 513. Motion to approve substitute teacher list for April and May. Um, obviously, don't have a lot of <laughs> substitute teaching going on, but uh, just to keep the list up to date, and current, uh, we felt the need to go ahead and put it on the board agenda to have it approved. Um, just, you know, for some reason over the summer, if we would need to utilize subs uh, for extended school year for students or anything along those lines, we want to make sure the list is up to date. So pretty much procedural. Any motion approved? So moved, Mr. President. Good by Mr. Kemmer, can I get a second? Second. Second by Mr. Both. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 514. Motion to approve policy revisions as presented. Second reading. Uh, we had 13 policies there um, that uh, for your consideration, all of them are required by law. Many of the changes were very minute things, just some wording to bring them uh, in accordance to law. So uh, I will, you know, put it out there. If anyone has any specific questions, be more than happy to talk about them. Uh, but these are the, the changes that we normally bring to the Board of Education in regards to these things are language proposed by the attorneys at OSBA. Uh, we don't we don't twist them too much or add anything to them uh, unless, unless we specifically need to. And in those situations, I bring that up during the discussion. So anything that was listed in the changes what was recommended language by the attorneys. So. Any questions? Motion passes. Approved. Second. Second by Mr. Bowden. Can I get a second? I'll say it. Second by Mr. Myers and Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. 
Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 515. Motion to approve an agreement for partnership grant funding with high schools that work Ohio, Central, and Southeast region. So this is actually um, an additional $5,000 that we would get for, through the high schools that work grant. Um, we have currently received $8,000 and this would be an additional five. This is really to help bridge some of the gaps that have come up during COVID-19. Um, so we will be using some of this money for some of our curriculum that we are proposing, um, but we do need to um, have a motion to approve the acceptance of this $5,000. Any questions? Any a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. I will second Mrs. Roberts. <clears throat> Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to 516. Motion to approve a purchase of math literacy and intervention products from Savis Learning Company LLC for $228,548.42. We, uh, and Savis is better known as Pearson. Uh, Pearson is the company that makes all of the state testing um, or develops the test that used during state testing. Um, it's been a goal over the past couple of years to align our curriculum both in literacy and in math. Uh, our teachers have put in a lot of time and effort uh, towards that uh, goal. And this purchase would provide a K through four literacy program uh, for Bremen and Pleasantville Elementary School. Uh, one of the tasks I've charged Mr. Myers with uh, as he uh, assumes the responsibilities of Mr. Philobom's position in August is to help drive this curriculum and bring the two buildings into closer alignment uh, so that when those students leave our elementary schools and get to Rushville Middle School, they have a very common foundation uh, educationally, both in literacy and math. So uh, the big step in this is uh, bringing in a K through four literacy piece that uh, are uh, tangible materials that kids will have in hand as well as an online uh, component to that. So if we are still in a, a distance learning situation will have additional online resources for those students uh, to and for our teachers to utilize. The second piece of this is uh, a math curriculum for grades 5 through 12. Uh, well, 5th through 8th grade and then Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry at the high school. Again, those are our tested areas. Um, and the math, uh, the math uh, curriculum again has tangible components that kids can have in their hand but also has that online component uh, to help with um, uh, distance learning should should we need that and even if we are in the classroom again those online resources can be utilized daily in the classroom and then uh, in conjunction with that also to help uh, bridge some gaps learning wise uh, some online learning pieces uh, uh, for example, one is called Success Maker uh, that can be incorporated with our elementary students to help with uh, gaps in learning and reading and literacy. So uh, really, this is something we've been working towards for several years. Uh, we've really pared back our curriculum purchases the last two or three years to save up for one large push. Uh, and, and we're kind of at that point. Uh, Pearson worked with us to break up the $228,000 price tag over three years. So it's a three year payment plan and the products that we are getting have a six year license. Uh, so this is, this is a component we'll have in place for six years. So uh, it's not something you plug and then a year from now, well, how's it going? We're, we're committed to this over six years. We'll be able to see how it's working and track its progress as, as these kids matriculate up through the grade levels. So, uh, I think it's a, a, a very valuable piece. I think it's a critical piece to move the district forward educationally. And I think it's going to provide a lot of supports for our, our teachers and our students. Um, so 
uh, definitely, you know, excited about that purchase. Um, it, it also uh, is providing tier three interventions uh, for our students who have gaps in their learning. And we really didn't have any structured tier three uh, interventions for our students. Uh, you know, our teachers have always gone above and beyond to, to pull resources from wherever they can find them, uh, searching on the internet, talking to other teachers. Uh, our teachers have utilized teachers pay teachers and try to find those resources on their own. So really this is a, a, a way for us to give them the tools to fill those gaps even more. And, we, and like we talked about earlier, we know those gaps are gonna be there come August. Uh, so the timing really is working out well for us that uh, you know, a time where we're gonna need these interventions the most, it was a time where we could make this type of move to put this into place. So. Um, would strongly recommend we we make that move. Uh, we did go to several vendors. I want to thank Ms. Schilling for all of her hard work and Ms. Roberts for her hard work on this. Uh, Ms. Schilling had meeting after meeting. Ms. Rice and Mr. Myers were involved with that. Uh, our you know communications with our teacher based teams, our building leadership teams. Uh, we looked at uh, HMH. Uh, we looked at. Um, uh, Pearson, obviously, and then Glencoe McGraw Hill. Uh, so all the major vendors and uh, the quotes were anywhere from two hundred thousand to four hundred thousand for these products. Uh, so Pearson was Pearson was the low bid uh, to meet the demands that, that we wanted. But on top of that, I, I think it is a, a a real positive that they helped develop the state testing. So their products should be very closely aligned with those state tests. So uh, just excited about the opportunity to bring this to the district. Was this something that was already planned in the budget or is this a surprise expense? Yes and no. Uh, like I said, the last two or three years, we, we haven't spent a lot on curriculum needs. Uh, Ms. Schilling's had a very tight budget the last few years. And, and that was done intentionally while we evaluated what we were doing, how we were doing it, and then how can we do it better. Uh, over the last three years, we've had math council meetings uh, to align our curriculum, uh, to work on mapping and pacing guides, uh, literacy, the last, and Mike, uh, Don can speak about this more, and Ms. Miller obviously can jump in. Uh, it's been quite a long time since we purchased any literacy curriculum at the elementary level. And I'm not, actually, I'm not for actually, sure. Go ahead, Mr. Myers. I was going to say, actually, the last one we purchased um, was the reading series that we're using now. It was purchased my first year here at Pleasantville, which was 10 years ago. So, you know, over a 10-year period, uh, they don't even offer that anymore, so you can't buy replacement pieces. So a book gets torn up, gets lost. You, you can't fill in what's missing. So our teachers have done a tremendous job of patchworking that together. And uh, I don't know that there's a more critical piece of a curriculum than early education literacy. Uh, you know, literacy at the elementary level, uh, that that branches out to every other subject. You know, if, if kids can't read, then you know, none of, nothing else happens. So um, it, it wasn't designated, hey, we're setting aside this amount of money for curriculum at this point in time. But over the past two or three years, we haven't been purchasing with a goal of once we've recognized what we want to do, then we'll be aggressive in our expenditure at that point. Uh, this was one that, you know, we went to Ms. Roberts and said, hey, here's what we want. Here's what we think is needed. Can we do it? And and to her credit, there were, didn't bat an eye. It, if, if this is good for kids and this is what we need, we'll figure it out. And uh, so very much it, it was a lot of people coming together to figure, figure it out, put the pieces of the puzzle together, and then ultimately Ms. Roberts figuring out the, the funding for it. So uh, I feel very strong about it. I feel good about the purchase. And if I too want to add in um, from the teaching part of it, um, there, there is real benefit to having that continuity and knowing that those gaps are kind of um, at least being addressed um, as far as the flow of the curriculum goes. 
And I think one of the things that we've noticed about students um, even prior to COVID is there, we're getting students that either come from other districts or who have been homeschooled or done online schooling and there are big gaps in their education. And I think there's gonna be a real benefit to a reading curriculum that has um, already built-in components to address that on top of the fact that we're dealing with COVID-19 and now we, we are expecting that there's gonna be some holes and gaps with everybody. So I, I'm excited about it. I think it's gonna be a real benefit. Ms. Roberts? Yeah, one other thing too that I wanted to mention is I think the thing that's really helping us here is that um, it, the payments are broken up over three years. It would be extremely challenging to kind of swallow a $228,000 purchase at this point in time. You will hear from me when I present our forecast. Um, the district is in good shape. That being said, there are a lot of un unknowns coming up for the fiscal year of 2021. And then we will also just cut our state funding um, for this month and next. So the key piece of this that's really been able to make this work is the three-year payment plan. Um, it's a lot easier to find funding, you know, for $80,000 and then an additional 73 and 73 over the next two years. Um, we obviously will be able to do that. So that's a big piece of it that, uh, you know, thanks to the hard work um, from Edie, that it was really, it was a big kind of game changer in being able to, to afford that at this point um, with everything that you will hear me present in the May forecast. Well, Mr. Bell, I'm, I'm glad it is just a six year contract because with today's technology and things changing, you know, 10 years just seems like too long. <laughs> yeah. You know, so uh, yeah, so after a six year period, it'll be time to, to reevaluate. And and one of the things that uh, Ms. Schilling really worked hard on is, uh, and this is an example of the math, uh, especially the five through eight. There, there are workbooks that the students will have in class, but the online components go from year to year. So those things will change from year to year. So as, as new standards are introduced or uh, if anything changes curriculum wise, mm -hmm. we'll be getting those updates yearly. Mm -hmm. So even right. at the end of six years, it, it's not going to be the exact same thing that we had in year one. So I, you know, to Ms. Schilling's credit, that was part of uh, the discussions with these different vendors is we, we don't want to be in a situation where we buy something year one and six years from now, we're still doing the same thing we we're doing six years ago because things are going to change. And, you know, We've learned that quite well from ODE that by the time you get a good hold on the standards, they change the standards. So um, I, I think that was a critical piece that that the uh, curriculum will evolve mm -hmm. each year. So I, I think that's a great point, Mr. Kim. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Need a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mr. Myers. Can I get a second? Second, Mr. President. Second by Mr. Kimmer. Mrs. Roberts. Myers. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Motion passes. Moves us to 517. Motion to approve the renewal and rates for BWC services with comp management beginning contract year September 1st, 2020, policy year January 1st, 2021. Ms. Roberts. Mrs. Roberts. So what this is, is this is our um, Bureau of Workers Comp. We use comp management as our third party um, to really run this for us. So this is just the yearly contracts that we need with them. Um, our estimated premium is $27,924. Um, and the annual fee that we'll have to pay up front for that is uh, 2745 This is very similar to what we paid last year. The only increase is you can see it's actually based off of our annual payroll. So just with the slight increase in payroll going into next year, that premium also goes up. Um, this is pretty standard. We've used them. We've actually had great, um, great service. We have a great team at comp management that, that really helps uh, answer questions quickly. So um, this is something that's pretty straightforward, and I would like to keep using them as a third-party vendor. Mm 
Need a motion to approve? So moved, Mr. President. Moved by Mr. Boat. Can I get a second? I will second. Mrs. Roberts? Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer? Yes. Um, Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Kimmer? Yes. Mr. Myers? Yes. Motion passes. That moves to 518. Motion to approve medical, dental, and vision insurance providers beginning July 1st, 2020. So this has obviously been um, a work in progress. Um, there's been quite a big team that's been involved in this. And what we would like to bring to the board tonight is our proposal to move our medical, dental, and vision insurance. Uh, as you know, we're currently sitting with SCOIC, and we have been with that consortium for over the last 20 years. Um, you know, with me being new to the role and just with the kind of the change in the industry, it was time to really look at our costs of insurance and look at our provider. And what I'm really happy to bring to the board tonight is that we have found um, an option that we think is going to save uh, the district, our taxpayers, and our employees a significant amount of money. Um, we would like to propose to move our medical insurance to United Healthcare, our dental insurance to Delta Dental, and then our vision insurance is currently with VSP, and we would stay with VSP. However, we would be on our own versus doing it through the consortium. One of the key factors that I would like to point out with this is that this is moving from being part of a consortium into being um, self-funded. And basically what that means is that we are in 100% control of all of the funds that come in and out of the districts to pay for our insurance versus kind of having the, the backing of a consortium. Um, at the end of the day, we still have to pay our admin costs and we still have to pay our claims and stop loss. So those major expenses are still out there. It's just that essentially what will happen is we um, will charge our premiums and then our premiums technically will go into our 024 account and then we will pay our admin bills and our um, claim bills through that account. Um, what that means is that, you know, if we have some excess, it's still part of the district. Um, and then it also means that if we, you know, insurance costs were higher than anticipated, we also still have that responsibility. Um, the one thing I do want to do is under the public content of this is you can pull up the SCOIC versus the new, new proposal for the board meeting. Um, and I'm going to walk you through this a little bit. Um, I'm going to try to keep it high level, but please stop me if there's anything that you have questions on. So. The first thing that you're going to see is our proposals for medical insurance. I have my current column and then our proposal column. Currently, we are sitting with SCOIC, which also which uses Care Factor. Our proposal is to move to United Healthcare. If we stay with SCOIC going into this year, starting June 1st of 20, I'm sorry, July 1st of 2020, our premiums would have to increase 17%. That is on top of a 17% increase that the district has seen the past three years. If we go with United Healthcare, we are able to hold our premiums as they are for this school year, meaning that what we charged our board and what we charged our employees this past year will be the same premiums that we charge go forward. So you can see we have three medical plans and as you walk from the top down, we have a total of 162 employees. If we stay with SCOIC, our medical cost will be $4.8 million, almost $4.9 million. If we move to United Healthcare, the estimated cost is $4.1 million. Just in medical expenses alone, that is a $750,000 potential savings. And the reason I say potentials, I want to be very clear, is that we are obviously estimating what our claims would be. We have admin costs that we know day in and day out what that is going to cost us each month. What we are, you know, there's people in the insurance industry that it's their role to really look at what they think our claim costs will be. So when you add that to our admin costs, that's where we're getting to the $4.1 million. So that could go up or down slightly, um, but that's really where we do feel strongly that our medical claims will come in in addition to the admin. The piece of this that we have actually also added in Sorry, is there a question? Yes, I'm just gonna 
point out uh, part part of this also, as Ms. Roberts was explaining, and Courtney, if you're going to touch on this, I apologize for jumping in. That's okay. It's okay. Uh, you can go through. Part, part of this is the consortium requires that you keep a certain level of funds with the consortium. And SUIC was proposing that uh, our level of funds would be nearly $1 million in a fund with them. Uh, whereas if you're, you know, on your own, then those funds stay with you. And so part of that 17% increase really uh, is for the being safety of consortium and building up that, that fund that would stay with them. Uh, so that's part of the 17 percent uh but you know i think miss roberts and I, I know i feel this way uh, in our current uh financial situation with the state we feel very comfortable keeping that money with us as opposed to building up a fund with the consortium so that that's part of that difference between 4.8 and 4.1 is building that fund with them and i miss roberts i think we're currently what about three hundred thousand. And they're wanting that to be up around a million. Yep. As of this month, um, as of the end of April, that fund is sitting at $380,000. They do want us to sit just below a million dollars. Um, you know, that is a piece of it. And then the other piece of it is the increase in administrative costs and our fixed costs. Um, it's, a piece, you know, even if we take that fund piece away and just say, okay, we would let the fund sit where it sits today there would still be around a 10% increase um, in our premiums. So even if you take that fund piece of it away, there would still be an increase versus if we go with United Healthcare, we are able to hold our um, costs and our premiums as is. Really that, that increase of those admin costs and those fixed costs are just, um, you know, we can't recover that. We can help control to an extent our claims um, you know, we can educate our employees. Um, you know, we can really look at how those claims are going to come in. But that fixed cost piece, there is nothing, you know, we can't we can't decrease that throughout the year. The other piece of United Healthcare is not only are those costs going down for admin, but the United Healthcare all the um, network also that's one of the largest networks in central Ohio. So they also have contracts with you know, doctors and hospitals and, and all the medical areas that um, they get discounts for their service. So there's about a 10% discount in services. So not only are we going to be saving in admin costs, and not only will the district save money by not having that increase, when our employees go to a doctor or go to a hospital where something may have cost them $500 in the past, that cost will significantly go down. So their max out of pocket is going to reach a lot further than it would if we were to stay with SUIC or care factor. Um, you know, our employees have had great care. They've had a great network. I'm happy to say that um, that network really would not change. Our employees would not see a big difference in coverage. Um, in fact, they really wouldn't see any, but it's like 99.9% .9 of the doctors are all the same. Um, it's really just those contracted services that will be essentially cheaper for our employees. So not only will our employees not have to see a rate um, increase in premiums, but they will also, their dollar will go further uh, when they do go, you know, seek medical medical help, whether it's at a hospital or a doctor service or whatever it may be. Um, so I do think that, uh, you know, we've used a third party to help us really reach out to multiple different providers. Um, we did receive several quotes back. And UHC by far was the strongest quote. So thank you to CBS for really helping us through that because they were help, helped us to navigate some of, you know, the information that came back. And I do think even with talking with UHC, um, you know, starting to ask some questions, they're a small army and they, um, you know, they have kind of people dedicated to everything. And so they'll really be able to help us if we have questions. The one thing, you know, to any employees that, you know, have questions, we have worked with Joel. Um, and, you know, I think we all feel strongly that we will definitely be sending out educational information to employees. Um, and really the only change they will see come July 1st, if, you know, if we move forward with this, is they will receive a new medical card that basically has United Healthcare on it versus Care Factor. Other than that, everything will carry 
um, from one provider to the next. So anything that they've already spent for the year, you know, that works up to their max out of pocket, that will carry. Medical history will carry. Everything will carry. So to our employees, the only thing they will receive is a new card and then their dollar will go further and they will not have to have um, a premium increase for this year. Any questions? I obviously will go on to, you know, dental and vision, but definitely want to stop and pause if there's any questions, anything I can help clarify, um, anything, you know, anything as we move further. One thing I do want to say too is if we go down this path, when we get closer to July, we will have some actual contracts to approve and some actual um, signatures to get. This is really just the motion to continue moving forward with where we would like our proposal to be. Uh, have you had any uh, questions about the three different plans that's going to be offered and whether there will be individuals willing to go to that third plan? So our plans, the way we are building it, will stay exactly as is for this year, and there will be zero changes. So we're working really hard with UHC to ensure that the underwriting of the plans, the three plans offered, the different tiers, everything is exactly the same because that was the big thing is it was shifting. We did not want any changes for our employees. So for this year, everything will be exactly the same as is. Mr. Kimmerick. Um, my question is then, if we do move forward with this, uh, with United Healthcare, um, June 30th, we re, we re, uh, reevaluate next year then? It's, it's for next, yes, for next year, um, we would essentially reevaluate rates. You know, obviously, we don't want to be jumping from from one insurance provider to the next, but it would give us that opportunity. You know, if something else presents itself. So when we are self insured, we're not locked into something. You know, for three years or five years, we can move year to year. Um, it's not something you know that we necessarily want to do, but if something comes up, you know, obviously there's a lot that's unpredictable in here. Um, so we would be able to have that flexibility and make changes or make moves as needed. The other thought is, you know, the $751,000 of projected savings um, can go towards that million dollars. You know, I know that that's over a year's time, but and I know it's estimated cost, but still the savings is significant. And, uh, it is, and I think that that's one of the big things, especially as I get into this forecast, is that with the unknowns um, and with this, you know, the state funding that's already been cut and what we're projecting to be cut for fiscal year 2021, the financial responsible decision for this is we cannot look at the number of those potential savings and walk away from it. Um, you know, we have been given, you know, good insurance coverage. We, you know, obviously we've had a long time relationship with SEOIC. Um, and I think really just, you know, is, is, when you've been with the business for that long, it's, you know, me coming in and having some new eyes on things. It was just time to really look and to, to reevaluate things. And I think that when we, you know, when we got these numbers back and really started evaluating our options, um, you know, we, at the time, we didn't even know what would be going on then. Um, but especially with what we know now, um, you know, to your point, looking at that $751,000 is, is a, a hard to potentially walk away from that type of savings. <laughs> The last thought or comment is this. I know you put a lot of hard work and effort in you and others and uh, into this, but for the best interest of the employees, the 162 employees, um, you know, I'm thankful, thankful to you and all those other people that have, that have uh, put their best foot forward in providing uh, this coverage. So, yeah, I, I appreciate it. No, it was definitely something that we owe it. We owe it to the district and the taxpayers and the employees. And it's, um, it's exciting. You know, it's exciting to see numbers like this and hope, you know, hopefully that, uh, like we said, that everything will come to fruition and we won't have any unexpected like we, like we did towards the end of this year. Okay. If there's nothing else, I'm going to go through dental and vision. Um, same setup that I had for medical if you look, we have our current with SCOIC, we actually do not have a dental network. Our proposal is to go to Delta Dental. Um, basically with SCOIC, our premiums would go to $109 per employee per month. Our proposal of going to Delta Dental would take us down to $101.15. Uh, 
Um, and so you can see there, there's just under an $18,000 savings. This is another one that's a Delta Dental has a huge network. Um, even just from some personal experience of going in, you know, Delta Dental, their costs and their contracts they can get with dental providers is huge. So not only will we be, um, you know, able to hold premiums here, but just our employees when they go to the dentist uh, will really be able to have a significant savings out of their pocket from this one. And, and just want to point out, this is also a self-funded plan. I should say all three of these are self-funded, but um, we did have a consortium possibility of um, within dental. And we decided that this rate um, and the flexibility that this gives us, um, we liked the flexibility more. Um, and at the end of the day, this is the one where we, we have a pretty decent fund already and just liked that flexibility going into next year. Any questions on dental? Okay, on to vision. Um, like I said, this uh, insurance provider actually would not change. It would stay with DSP. It would just be going through the consortium or going on our own. Currently, if we go with SUIC, our premiums will be at $1,199. You will see that going direct, uh, it is a slightly higher premium of $1,266. Um, so the total year is $27,625 or $29,169. So this is actually slightly more expensive to be out there by ourself. Um, however, I think of, you know, $1,500 more is still pretty good in the grand, the grand plan of everything. Cause you can see down below in red, I have our, our potential total cost savings of um, $767,000. So between medical, dental and vision, um, you know, we have the potential to save that much. So while this, this is slightly higher, um, you know, I think in the grand plan of things, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is that you do have visibility to what the plans would cover um, and the other attachment that's out there. Um, this will be something that we obviously walk through with all of our employees. Um, we get Mr. Denny involved. He has seen all of these documents. Um, I should say he's he has not seen my, uh, well, he, yeah, he's seen all of my documents. I have walked him through this. So it's obviously over the next few months, we'd really work to get all this information in our employees' hands just so that there's a comfort level of change. Um, I know we've had some employees who've been with the district for a long time. So they've had Care Factor um, for a very long time. So obviously want to make that transition as seamless as possible for them. Any questions or anything I can help answer? I realize this is a major change. And like I said, you will see over the next few board meetings, um, we will have some additional actual contracts that once we have all the underwriting done and all the contracts done, we will actually approve contracts. Um, what I'm just looking for at this point is just kind of everybody's okay and get everybody's feelings that everybody does, you know, feel good that this is the right decision to make um, and to move forward with these three providers. Any questions? I do want to, I want to thank Ms. Roberts for all the hard work Mr. Kimmel brought it up. Uh, she has done some yeoman's work on this. I uh, just a lot of time, effort, energy, uh, communications with a lot of different people, uh, different treasurers around us, um, insurance people from all over. So, uh, Ms. Roberts, thank you for all you've done. Uh, in a short period of time, you obviously have stepped into a tough situation and have uh, really come through admirably. So we, we appreciate all your hard work on this. Oh, well, thank you. All right, if there's nothing else, I need a motion to approve. So move, Mr. Moved by Mr. Hoffman. Make a second. Second, Mr. President. Second by Mr. Kimmer, Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Hoffman. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Uh, Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Bo. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Motion passes. Moves us to 519. Motion to approve May five year forecast and notes. Mrs. Roberts. Okay, so this is the big one um, for me this evening. So obviously, uh, in the treasurer's world, we submit forecasts every October and then in May. Um, the May forecast is really a true up of where that year is landing as well as the next four years to come. 
Uh, the big thing that I want to point out with this forecast is that obviously at the end of the year, we have, um, you know, along with everything else, been thrown some surprises. So it was announced a few weeks ago that we would be um, receiving a cut in state funding for our last three payments of the year. Uh, and then we also, there's a lot of unknowns for fiscal year 2021. So what I would like to do as I walk you through this is I'm actually going to skip you all the way to the very last page of the forecast. So it is page 22 of the forecast. Um, and this is really the five-year forecast. I think with how much detail is in there, um, I can definitely answer any questions as we go. But I think with everything that has gone on just even over the past few weeks, um, you know, I think it's probably easiest to jump to this last page. So the first few things I want to point out is if you go down to the green bar, we have an excess of revenue for this year. I plan this and I'm projecting this to come in at 826,486. Our revenue over expenses, meaning that we are in the good for this year. Um, what that means is that our cash balance will come in at almost $11.5 million. We started the year at 10.7 million. So when you add that 826, um, that's where you're getting that 11.4. So at the end of the year, I will say, I feel like the district is in a strong financial position. You will see that, um, you know, as we go over the next few years, um, we have taken some steps to protect ourselves from where we think some of the cuts will come in, um, but we do not have a lot of guidance at this time. So a few things, and I'm going to now walk you from top to bottom, and a few things will hit the year 2020, and then the others will hit 2021 and beyond. So I'll kind of talk to them as a group. Um, the first few things, if we look at um, general property tax and our public utility tax, We've talked about this. We had increased property valuations in Fairfield. Our pup values went up due to the pipeline. So we've seen these, we've kind of talked about these over the last few months. Where I want to really direct your attention is to income tax. For the year, and this is a true up number because we have received 100% of our income tax at this point. Our income tax came in at $5.2 million. This was up seven, almost 8% to last year. This is something that is obviously unknown as we go into years 2021 and then 2022, 2023, and 2024. So while we had an almost 8% increase this year, what I have done for next year is I have actually decreased our income tax by 3% from this year. Across the board, it's going anywhere from people holding income flat to decreasing 10% and then decreasing you know, 5% in other years. Um, since we have seen some pretty significant increases over the past few years, I actually only decreased ours 3%. Um, it's something this is an unknown. It's something that, you know, when I kind of look at where our trend history has been, I think the 3% should cover us. Um, that is a 4.5% decrease from where we originally had 2021 sitting. So it's a 3% decrease from 2020 a 4.5% decrease from where we had 2021 sitting originally. This is one of the main things that will affect our revenue go forward. So we had a really strong year this year, which is obviously helping with that 826 um, revenue over expenditures. However, in the future years, this is an area that our revenue will probably see a pretty significant cut. The next two lines down, if you look, this is our state funding. We were projected to receive about $9.5 million this year, and we were on target to receive that. However, about two weeks ago, it was announced when um, Governor DeWine made his state cuts and decreased $300 million across the state, we actually received a $338,000 decrease. The big thing is that that decrease will be taken out of the last three payments of the year. So we get two payments a month. So it'll come out of the last payment of May and then both payments in um, in June. So while it's a 20% decrease over the next few payments, it's about a 4% decrease for the year. I will say this is the biggest unknown going into next year. This is the thing that will swing our budget more than anything else that we do. And the tough thing is that we do not have control over this. So as I look at 2021, I have decreased where we thought our state funding would come in an additional 6% or $600,000. That's 
That's including a $50,000 decrease in casino revenue. We typically see about $100,000 um, each year in casino. Obviously, with casinos being closed and not knowing what's going to happen, I just cut that in half. Um, so between state funding and um, casino, we cut $600,000. Like I said, that is 6%. We have been told to budget anywhere from five to 20%. If we see a 20% decrease in our state funding, that's 1.9, almost $1.9 million. That is something that's obviously the biggest thing that will impact our um, forecast for the next year. So while I've taken $600 out of next year, you can see that 2021, we come in with um, revenue over expenditures of $387,000. If I have to decrease that by additional 1.3 on top of the 600, that will obviously take our forecast negative as it sits today. Clearly there are things that we will do and that Mr. Belville and I have already talked, um, you know, clearly we will really look at all the expenditures um, and really look at the supplies that we're, you know, that we're spending what can we do, um, you know, to really look at purchase services and how can we help our, how can we help those, um, you know, the bottom line. But I will say that 1.9 number is, is scary. Um, we are hoping to possibly have some sort of guidance by mid-June. Um, and a big thing, obviously, is going to be what happens in the fall semester. Um, what happens as we go back to school? Are we virtual? Are there, you know, are we having to increase bus routes? What's going to happen? So, um this piece of it obviously will really, you know, have a lot of have a lot of flux on our on our overall um, forecast. Um, the piece of it also that I wanted to point out is that the other things that went into this year that are good positive things, and I brought this up last board meeting, is that I was able to increase our catastrophic cost funding from sixty thousand dollars to one hundred and fifty. Um, what I was able to do was just file some additional uh, areas of catastrophic cost that we had not filed in the past. So I was able to get hopefully around an additional $90,000. Um, I will say this is in flux as it's not approved yet. It's not approved for any district yet. Basically what the state does is they look at all of the submissions and then they come back and say, okay, based on the amount of money that they have to fund, they will fund a percent of our um, catastrophic costs. So right now I have a max of $525,000 that we could receive. However, I'm projecting that we'll receive about 30%. Um, that's where the, the percentages come in the past few years. So if we receive that 30%, it would get us about $150,000, which is $90,000 above what has been uh, what was in the forecast and what has been filed in the past. So that's good. Um, the other piece of this is we are receiving an additional $205,000 from the CARES Act that is not in our forecast right now. People are not putting it in forecasts. We do think it'll hit year 2021, not 2020. Um, but until we see those numbers and until we see everything come through, we're not putting that in the forecast. So that's good because that's an additional $200,000 that to our good that we will um, still receive. The other piece of revenue to point out that's a very, very important piece is this forecast still has all of our wellness funds in there. So for 2020, we received $437,000 and we're really able to pay salaries out of that. Um, next year, we are planned to get $619,000. I do not think Governor DeWine is going to cut this. It has been his big kind of thing. He's really stood behind. Um, he's really guaranteed that this will not be cut. However, he obviously was not anticipating have a, having a pandemic. pandemic. So um, that's $600,000 going into next year that is funding that hopefully we will continue to see and it is living in our forecast. Before I move into expenditures, are there any questions on revenue or any questions on state funding or income tax or anything that I can help answer before I continue into expenditures? No? Okay. As you move down and you go into our expenditure lines, um, I feel strongly that where I have 20 uh, fiscal year 2020 coming in, I think I feel very strong that this is where we're going to land. At this point in the year, we're really able to project our um, where our salaries are going to come in, where benefits are going to come in. So those two pieces, lines 3.01 and 3.02, should be pretty dead on. 
Um, we have three pays left, uh, one, one more pay in May, and then obviously the two pays in June. So um, between those pays, you know, I think I've really hit that 3.01 line. So that should be pretty solidified. Same with employee benefits. The other piece, purchase services, this is a piece that I thought would come down a little more being closed. Um, so I'm holding it pretty steady. Um, and, you know, not a ton of movement in that area. The last piece is supplies and materials. Um, the major things that we did add, obviously there's the $80,000 for the curriculum that we added, which this actually nets out to be about $67,000 because we do have those two grants that we're using of $13,000, five of that being what we approved tonight. Um, so that should be a piece of capital that would be, you know, I think for the balance of the year, we're in a really good spot. The other piece of this is we did move um, Chromebooks in the past. We have purchased them out of PI. We are moving these into general fund. Reason behind that is that PI typically sees something that it has at least a lifespan of at least five years. And with Chromebooks these days, they're being replaced more often. So we are moving that expense into our general fund. The Chromebook purchase for this year, the delivery has actually been shifted into July. So therefore I'm moving a $70,000 expense from 2020 into 2021. However, what that means is that 2021 will have to see two Chromebook purchases. So we will have 100, roughly $140,000 of Chromebook purchases in 2021. Um, the other thing is that Mr. Belleville and I have really cut off any supply purchases for the balance of the year, unless it is something that is 100% mandatory that we absolutely have to do. Supplies is the cost that we can control ourselves. It is very important with all the cuts that have happened. We really need to come in with this overage this year so that we can help balance out our next few years. Um, we did make that decision to cut off those supply purchases. Obviously, if there's something that is definitely necessary, you know, we still have that room. But you can see that um, over my next few months, our capital, or I'm sorry, our supply purchases are very, very low. Um, I will say for the month of April, we only spent $3,500 on supplies, and we typically spend around $40,000. I mentioned that earlier. So I do think that our supply purchases for the balance of the year are in a good spot. Um, let's see. The other thing that I want to point out is obviously as you walk across the years and you look at the, the green line, that's the excess of revenue. This year we're projecting the 826,000. Next year we're projecting 387. That could obviously, um, you know, sway based on state funding. The other things that we want to look at as we go over our next few years, as we get to 2022, we're at 481. In 2023, we are negative 227,000 and then negative 1 million. A few things that I want to note on this is if you jump up to lines 3.10, this year, obviously, you know, we've talked a lot about approving all the contracts. We have $200,000 sitting in this year's headcount that I actually think we will not end up using based on people who are retiring. So I do think it'll be a wash based on retirements and then new headcount. As we look across from the years, we do not have any additional headcount in our forecast until 2024. And in 2024, we have one new headcount. That is it at this point. Now, obviously, as the years go on, things could change. Funding could change. But I do want to point out there's a very important factor that right now we do not have any additional headcount. Um, and I actually feel good about the headcount that we are hiring for this year that we are able, while I have $200,000 sitting in here based on everybody who's retiring um, and leaving the district and then adding new employees in, it is um, pretty much of a flat wash. So that's good because that could be $200,000 to come back to our bottom line. Um, the other thing is as we get into 2024, we are currently required with every income tax collection, so quarterly, we are required to transfer 0.75% of our 1%. We have a, we collect 2%, but 0.75% of 1%, we're required to transfer to our debt retirement. We do believe that based on the amount of money that has been, been transferred to that debt retirement, come 2024, it's going to be very close, but come 2024, we think we're going to pay off that debt. 
This year, we're transferring about $1.9 million. If we do not have to transfer that in 2024, that means that we'll come back into general fund. That $1.9 million will then swing that bottom line to be essentially over $1 million. So we go from being negative $1 million to being over $1 million if that money can stay in the general fund. So again, like I said, that's going to be very close, um, but we do think and we would like to work towards that plan of paying off that piece of debt um, that would require us to not transfer that 0.75%, which would obviously help bring additional income tax to general fund versus moving it out of the general fund. So I want to stress, I do think that while, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, um, especially with next year, I feel strongly where this year's coming in. Next year, I think, is our year of the most unknowns. I think what we need to do as a district is obviously we're still working towards our goals obviously by the curriculum purchase that we made tonight. Um, there are still things that we need to continue to better our students and to better our employees. That being said, as a district, we have to, and it'll be you know, my job to really keep a keen eye on all the expenditures that we have. Uh, you know, we would have never thought we would have been going into a possibility of having a $1.9 million um, or a 20% cut in our state funding. So, while yes, we have an excess of this year, and yes, I'm projecting an excess of next year, it just goes to prove that you can never predict anything. So we really need to preserve that and really ensure that we're evaluating all of our major expenses. Um, there are a few major expenses going into next year that we're planning for. Um, you know, we have some technology that we're looking at. We have some upgrades that we need to make. Um, obviously, this year, it, you know, the technology upgrades with the Chromebooks really paid off. So we need to continue to ensure our district is in a good spot with technology. Um, and at the same time, we need to make sure that we are looking at other costs and other expenditures in order to fund that. Um, we do have about a $294,000 uh, technology budget for next year that um, we need to fund and that we need to find ways to pay for that. So um, between that and some of the curriculum, you know, we do have some major things to fund, but I feel confident that we still want to move forward with those. And obviously, as we know more with state funding and as we start to see some of our insurance, um, insurance, you know, payments come in in the first few quarters, we'll have a better idea of where, where I'm sorry, not insurance payments, um, income tax, where our income tax is going to come in. Um, we'll have a better idea of what, you know, what decreases or even potentially holding flat. Um, we'll have an in, in income, but those are kind of the major things that are somewhat out of our hands um, that as we see more throughout the year, we'll be able to solidify a little bit of that. So for right now, we just really need to watch our expenses um, and really keep a keen eye on anything that we are, that we're purchasing. Um, I will be working the next month and a half, obviously between now and the beginning of July to come up with those budgets for next year. Um, this was the first step to really get this approved. And then we'll go in line by line and look at budgets and really see, um, you know, what we need to do with budgets and what those big projects are and what we want to focus on to, to move the district forward. It's a lot of information. I realize I jumped to the last page, but I think this is obviously the easiest place to see all of the information at once. Um, more than happy to go into more detail. Um, more than happy to continue sharing, but I thought if there's any questions, let me let me help answer those. I don't. It's, this is not really a question. It's a comment more than anything. Um, I, I guess what concerns me going into next year with all the unknowns and some of the conversations that I've heard so far about how school may look next year. It worries me about how we're going to keep up with some extra expenses that could be PPE, masks for yeah. students, it could be cleaning supplies, it could be additional custodial staff trying to keep everything wiped down in between maybe two different groups. I hope that's not the case, but that's, I guess, what worries me. And, and again, we, we probably won't know what that looks like for at least another month or more. But I am completely 100% there with you. I definitely agree. Those are some of the expenses. And that's why we've actually held some of the expenses in here where we have. The other thing actually I didn't point out, and I apologize, is in our employee benefits, I actually have an 8% increase for insurance costs in here. Part of that is a buffer. 
So if, you know, if we truly see a flat insurance cost from last year, we do have somewhat of a buffer that would help to pay for some of those expenses. So additional cleaning supplies, um, you know, additional, like you're saying, PPE, any of that extra stuff, we do have a little bit of a buffer if, you know, those insurance costs truly pan out to save that money. Um, that piece of it is buffered in here because I do not have the flat insurance cost in here. So there is some money that uh, could help to pay for those, but I definitely agree. And I think that's the biggest concern when, you know, when we hear that there could be a 20% decrease in state funding, but yet we would see increases in the things that we are required to purchase between, you know, masks for students. Um, I can only imagine the cost of masks that we could have even for our elementary and kindergarten students. I mean, you know, we would have to buy several masks per day um, for each of those students. So that cost alone is, is significant. Um, and to your point, that is all unknown. So until we know more, um, I, you know, I have built some of those buffers in here, but until we know more, um, you know, we'll have to manage that each month. And that's why we've really, that's why Mr. Velvo and I have cut off supply costs for now. Um, that's why we're taking a keen eye on every single rec that comes through, um, you know, whether it be $80 or $5,000, we're really looking at all those recs because we don't know, we don't know what's to come and we don't know what could be thrown at us. So we really need to make sure we are prepared for that. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, thanks, Courtney, because by going to this page here, it cleaned up a lot because that's the kind of page that we're used to seeing over the past 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. it, it's the, the numbers we're used to seeing. So it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise to see in four or five years down the road that those numbers start getting skewed a little bit. But we're used to seeing this form. And so it, you went into much more detail than Mr. Miller normally did, but yet this is a form that we're used to looking at at this point in time. Good. And I, I, I was hoping it's one of those things that with so many unknown pieces right now, you know, it's funny because we're going into this year of planning a forecast and it's typically when you go into planning a forecast, you like to have things solidified. You like to have projections out there and it's just the time, you know, like everything else right now is just with, you know, with trying to be cautious with everything is that we, um, you know, we're projecting as much as we can, but until we start hearing from the state as to what next year would bring. Um, so it, while, yeah, I'm good. I'm glad to hear that this is a form that you're used to seeing. Um, so if there are any other questions, you know, please feel free, even if something comes up, um, you know, at a different time and we can obviously address it in another meeting as well. Anybody else? All right. I need a motion to approve the May five-year forecast. So moved. Moved by Mr. Myers. Can I get a second? Second, Mr. President. Second by Mr. Kimmer. Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Bope. Mr. Bope. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Motion passes. Moves to send to number six. 6.1 superintendent updates, Mr. Belleville. I have a few things this evening. Um, first of all, I want to remind board members and community that Friday at six o'clock, we'll have our state of schools. That will be virtual. Uh, we'll have a link posted on the website, but uh, thanks to Mr. Doss, uh, we have established a YouTube channel for the district uh, that houses now houses our live stream of board of education meetings, uh, as well as other content that we can put on there. So if you go to youtube.fairfieldunion.org, uh, so it's basically our website, YouTube, then fairfieldunion.org, that will take you to our YouTube page and the state of schools will be there. You'll just click on it. Uh, the board meetings are there. You just click on them to watch. Uh, those are live streams. So uh, try to make that simple for the community. So we'll, we'll be getting that information out all week long. So. I uh, hope you'll be able to join us for that. I uh, want to thank our principals for uh, for their work towards the state of schools. Uh, we have a lot of good information that we'll be sharing, so I think Friday night will be valuable for the community. Uh, supplemental contracts for the fall. 
uh, we were supposed to have uh, a lot of supplementals on the meeting agenda tonight uh, for department heads, for clubs and organizations, fall sports, you know, different things. Uh, we are holding off on those until we can complete an MOU with the association. Uh, been working closely with Mr. Denny uh, to come to an understanding that depending on what school looks like in August, uh, you know, a lot of positive moves this week with opening up various sports, so that very encouraging to see. But until we know what the exact landscape is going to be, uh, we don't want to issue contracts until there's an understanding with the association that, you know, if, if we don't have a season, you know, we would not be in a position to pay the supplemental. Uh, the spring sports were a little bit different because those seasons had started. The coaches were interacting with the kids. Uh, so we felt strongly that we should pay those supplementals in full. Uh, and and are doing that, uh, but the fall would be a little bit different situation if the season never got started. So, um, can expect to see those supplemental contracts for the fall on the June eighth board agenda. <clears throat> In terms of next year, Mr. Hoffman brought up, uh, you know, looking at next school year, there is a, a statewide committee working on plans for what schools would look like. Uh, I've seen early drafts of the plans that uh, they're working on at the state level. Um, nothing earth shattering yet. Uh, it's really just kind of a lot of talk. Uh, there are multiple thoughts out there, whether it be 100% virtual, whether it be back in session as normal uh, with students in classrooms. Uh, my gut is telling me we'll fall somewhere in between that. There'll, there'll be some sort of blended uh, educational experience where some kids are physically in the classroom and some kids are virtually at home, whether that's due to a medical medical condition of the student that uh, you know, the parents don't want the student to be at school or we feel like the student should be should not be at school. Uh, talk to Ms. Osborne about those type of situations and kind of thinking that through. Um, so really a lot of unknowns uh, as to what it would look like. Uh, as far as purchases, we've already started looking at some of those things, whether it be masks, cleaning supplies, so on and so forth. Uh, I had Randy Beyer uh, go ahead and start contacting Janton to look at different solutions for cleaning. Uh, right now we've ordered, uh, instead of relying on wipes, because uh, those are so difficult to buy in bulk right now, we're ordering spray bottles. We'll mix solution to fill the bottles, uh, towels, and then be able to clean in that fashion. Uh, just as effective, but more readily available. Uh, so uh, we're looking at some of those type of things. Uh, we've already started ordering some gloves and different supplies like that to have on hand. But until we have a firm grasp on how it's going to look, I don't want to go ordering a bunch of things and then us not need them. I have a little concern about the mask because mm -hmm. if, if it's my my mask or my child's mask, I just assume supply that myself and be able to get one that we could wash and reuse and take care of. And it may be a mix of if a kid doesn't bring one in, then we've got to supply that, but yep. certainly have to consider what parents might want to supply their own kids uh, so that they have a little bit more control over that. Well, and. I think there's a very real concern. I ordered masks a month ago, yeah. and they're still not in, and there's a delay on them. And you know, there are different places you can, they tell you that you've been ordering them. Uh, I ordered 500 uh, to have uh, some at each building as we did the Chromebook collection. And uh, I well over a month ago I ordered these things and still waiting on them to come in. So. Even if the state tells us that we need to buy masks and supply them, is that even a possibility? Can you even get them? Uh, we do have, uh, Ms. Osborne has been on top of this from day one. Uh, you know, and it's probably a good juncture to say this. Uh, uh, there's been a, a lot of praise going all the way around, but that's a name that hasn't been mentioned a lot. Uh, Ms. Osborne and I, had a lot of conversations in late January, early February about planning for this and what do we do from a medical standpoint, her viewpoint. And uh, 
So she was on top of this from the beginning as well and uh, has done great work and been in constant communication with me uh, during the closure. And, and we've been talking about plans for next year. Uh, she's heading up a, a group of ladies, I believe, uh, district personnel that are working on making masks for our district staff. They'd be reusable, uh, washable masks uh, that we would provide to staff and, and those ladies uh, are wanting to volunteer and, and do that work and make those for our staff members. So I believe that is ongoing right now. And uh, so we're, we're looking at different solutions and options. Uh, I can tell you the plans that have been out there and talked about uh, in superintendent circles have been two day weeks, uh, you know, students go every other day. Friday is either a, a complete day off of no kids physically here. Everybody's virtual on Fridays uh, to every other day and every other Friday. Uh, there's one plan floated out there that uh, it would be half days. Some kids come in the morning, then the other half the kids come in the afternoon. Uh, I, I can tell you for us, for us, that, that, that is a non-starter because the busing would be just too large. We won't even be able to bus them because they can't be on the bus in that close proximity to even do that. In the state level plan, they have busing, uh, <laughs> and, which makes no sense. How do you keep kids six feet apart on a bus? Now, the high back chairs, you can go front to back because of the high backs, but you literally have to be one child per seat. So you're, I mean, you're cutting your capacity down by a third in some cases. Uh, so, um, you know, there, there's a lot of pieces out there that are still being debated how you work through those. Uh, my, in my mind, if we are in some sort of blended uh, education where you have kids coming in shifts, uh, Right now, I would lean towards and propose to the board that we consider alternating weeks instead of alternating days. You bring group A of students in Monday through Friday, while group B is virtual, and then flip those the next week. So on Friday, if kids don't have internet or whatever, you can hand them a packet of work that here is reinforcement materials from what we've covered this week. Then your next group comes in, they turn in their packet on Monday, you roll the materials Monday through Friday, I, I think you'd be much better off having consistency of having the kids every day. Plus, for child care, yeah, I think, I, I think it'd be much easier for a parent to find somebody to watch a kid for a week at a time as opposed to every other day. And you know, is it my Friday to go, or like was that last Friday? I mean, it's well, a lot of confusion there. And I was trying to wrap my head around if you're bringing in half the student body one day and then the other half the next. How do you clean in between that? And now you're cleaning every other day, every day. Well, I think your that plan looks a lot more attractive because you've got the same students. If somebody gets exposed, now you've limited your exposure to half the student yeah. body versus, gosh, did the did today's exposure carry over to tomorrow? I mean, right. the other, the other piece of it is, uh, you know, I've, I've had this conversation with Mr. Myers a little bit. Uh, do you rotate students? Or do you leave students in a room and you rotate teachers to the students so they limit their exposure to others? I mean, there are a lot of things on the table, and right now everything is purely speculative. Uh, but we do have to start the planning process now. Uh, so there, there's going to be a, a lot of plans on the big board, and, you know, just depending on the scenario, um, and, and the, the one piece of guidance I've tried to, I've tried to share with teachers and, and our, our other staff members that I've gone through and I've you know, met with people in the district is, you know, it's May 18th, let's get to Tuesday, then we'll worry about August. Uh, so, uh, you know, while we want to work behind the scenes and think about this long term, we really want our staff members, our community members, our teachers to focus on the here and now. Mm -hmm. Stay in the present moment. Uh, let, let's finish this week. Let's let's get to the last day of school on Thursday, and then really our community needs a break. Our teachers need a break. Our staff members need a break. Our kids need a break, and they can exhale. And we'll we'll start planning for August when when we need to. Yes, sir. Well, and I think given a couple more weeks of data, 
after things have opened up, mm -hmm. we'll be able to see a better picture of what Paul may look like. Correct. So I think that's a, a good um, You know, we, we've kind of had the approach all along. We we're very proactive early on and very aggressive in preparations. But now I think we're to that point where it's time to take a step back and and pump the brakes and let some things unfold. Uh, to your point, let's let's let some time pass. Let's see what happens once things open up, and that will that will dictate and guide some of our decision making. Uh, and kind of building on what Miss Roberts was talking about in the forecast, uh, we did make the decision, and I've sent the message out to to our teachers and staff members that we want to pause all requisitions uh, until after July first. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, we don't know what school's going to look like in come August. So, you know, while we may normally need to buy, you know, five thousand dollars worth of paper because we're running copies in schools and things like that, if we're one hundred percent virtual, which is still a possibility, we don't need all that paper. We're not printing a bunch of stuff. So, really, we need to wait and let some time laps before we start approving a bunch of requisitions until we know what schools gonna look like then the other piece of that until we know what funding looks like uh you know things we've always purchased in the past we may have to find a way to do without for a year uh, so that's all part of it uh, i've also asked teachers uh that we're going to put a freeze on professional development workshops uh and that's something that's normally in the consent agenda uh, any workshops that, that require a fee for attendance, uh, we're going to freeze those over the summer. Again, until we know what the fall looks like, until we know what funding looks like, our professional development may need to change come late July uh, to accommodate what school's going to look like. So we're going to hold off on doing any professional development that, that does not touch contractual things, like if teachers are taking classes for a master's degree or taking college classes to renew a license, those things are covered by contract. We'll continue to reimburse as we always have uh, for those things. But just new workshops that, that are elective type of things, we are putting a freeze on those. Uh, as Ms. Roberts alluded to, you know, we're, we're looking at our supplies. Uh, you know, I've talked to uh, Tom Pugh and, and Matt and uh, Randy Byer. Uh, I've had conversations with Mr. Philbaum that, you know, we really need to closely monitor the supplies we're buying, what we're buying, how much we're buying. Uh, you know, I, every stone, we're, we're flipping over. I had a conversation with Randy, I think it was two days ago, or over the weekend, uh, we ordered four mop handles. They wanted to order four mop handles for Pleasantville. So what, there's two custodians at Pleasantville. Let's get two mop handles instead of four. Uh, you know, we're not going to use four at one time. Now, if we need four, we'll buy two more later, but we only need two right now. So it's it's a little, you know, and those seem like nickel and dime things, but they, they do add up over time. So uh, we, we will closely scrutinize every dollar that is spent and uh, make sure we're spending it wisely. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, we have vowed to our teachers and our staff that, you know, we'll do everything we can to control costs, but uh, we do that knowing that our main goal is to protect jobs. Uh, and, and that is critical uh, to me uh, to protect every job in the district and we'll, we'll cut funding wherever we can to save every single job in this district. So uh, I think that's important. Uh, insurance obviously goes into that as well. And then, uh, you know, there are things going on around the district that, that have to happen to maintain facilities. Otherwise, you have a bigger expense down the line. Uh, so uh, our resealing project is ongoing. Uh, weather's kind of hurting us right now, but, uh, you know, we, we found a great partner in Vasco a few years ago when they did our track, and they've been great to work with in adjusting their schedules. Uh, we were scheduled to do all of this late June, early July, uh, you know, I called them and said, hey, with all this closure, can we move to May? And they said, as soon as the plants open, then we'll start, we'll push you to the front of the line. And, and they did that. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've been great to work with. Uh, Dynamics uh, continues to be a strong partner for us. Uh, we, you know, we've had roofing issues at the high school for some time. 
uh, dynamics, as it turns out, also does roofing. We didn't know until just a random conversation. Uh, they came in and with Tom and Matt found several leaks at the high school that we have had multiple companies in to look at. Tom and Matt have looked at, we couldn't find. Uh, they, they found, I know they plugged, I'm wanting to say Tom told me eight or nine leaks that they found. And I know over the past two or three weeks, and Mr. McPhail can add to this, he, he's been doing much longer, much more than I have, but I was in the auditorium yesterday and there was a big leak in the hallway of the auditorium you know, right before we went on break because we were discussing it to get it fixed for the play. I was in there yesterday and didn't notice any water stains on the on the ceiling there. So I really feel like we've made made some lead way with the with the leaks in the roof over there. And, um, and Mr. Phil Baum, you can jump in on that as well. If, you know, uh, anything to add there? And uh, I know uh, I think there's a couple leaks at Rushville Middle School that we'll we'll get them back out to take a look at those as well. Uh, so. Um, you know, there's still work going on, and, and a lot of this stuff, we, we have to maintain a certain level of maintenance just to make sure we don't have bigger expenditures down the line. So, um, overall, uh, you know, business is <coughs> progressing as it should this time of year, uh, and uh, we're making a hard push to Thursday in our scheduled last day of school, and uh, we're looking forward to this weekend and the, the parade for our seniors. And then uh, moving on into uh, our graduation plans with the uh, private ceremonies for families, I think that can be a special thing for each family. And then the airing of graduation come June fourteenth, uh, you know, I think those will all be positive, positive things going forward. So I want to thank my principals, uh, all of our staff members, from you know every custodian that's here daily, taking care of the buildings to. Uh, our cooks who've worked extremely hard on Sundays. Uh, after this past Sunday, we've eclipsed 43,000 meals served, uh, which is just amazing work uh, from all of our volunteers, bus drivers, teachers, you name it. Every staff member in this district, it's just been a true blessing to see them all come together for our community. And, uh, and lastly, a, you know, a huge thank you to, to the five of you. Uh, your support, guidance, leadership uh, for all of us uh, have made it all possible. Uh, we couldn't do what we do without your support and uh, and uh, we, we're, we're blessed to have a great Board of Education to work for. So thank you for that. And that's all I have. Starbucks. Um, to be honest, I actually do not have a ton to add tonight. I think a lot of my items from this week between insurance and forecasts and workers comp everything has pretty much been out there so i actually do not have any additional updates on my end this one, yes this one, <laughs> light comment um you know made me smile uh, as we own a uh, you know credit to mr Ro uh mr belleville and, and mrs roberts and as um i hear mr belleville say we only need two moth panels instead of four uh, Mr. Miller's smiling out there right now. <laughs> <laughs> he is smiling with pride. Uh, so, uh, no, thanks. Uh, just as a light note, it, it made me think of Mr. Miller, and uh, that's what he would be in the conversation with you, uh, Mrs. Roberts, and you, Mr. Belleville, and, and leaving those uh, stone unturned. And uh, uh, it, it, just, it made me smile as I li listened, to, listened to those words. So. Uh, I, yeah. you, you mentioned Mr. Miller there real quick. Um, <laughs> in our State of Schools Friday night, we will award the first Kevin Miller Memorial Scholarship. Uh, I had a conversation with Sherry over the weekend, and uh, um, they, they had talked about doing two $1,000 scholarships, and uh, when they reviewed the uh, 10 Senior Salute honorees, uh, they decided to award the Kevin Miller Scholarship to one of the 10 senior salute honorees. Uh, that was something that Kevin really enjoyed being a part of and helping found here was the senior salute. Uh, so they, they wanted to use those 10 individuals as their pool for the scholarship. After looking at all the applications, uh, a little kind of reveal a little bit for Friday night, uh, they decided to award one scholarship worth $2,000. Uh, so that's a that's a huge scholarship. That's uh, a lot of money. 
and uh, so a little cliffhanger to find out Friday night. <laughs> Which of our ten senior salute honorees uh, just picked up two thousand dollars to help the college? Wow. Yeah. So, yes, Mr. Just one more comment, Mrs. Uh, Roberts, in, in regards to the forecast. Uh, you know, as Mr. Uh, both mentioned, uh, we do we are familiar with going to the six point zero one zero line, um, but. Uh, it always made me uh, smile, and uh, as, as Mr. Miller would present that uh, forecast, that it was always so cloudy. It was never a storm, but it was never, <laughs> but the sun never ever come out. So I thank you for making it less cloudy. You, you're, you're still giving me the sunshine, but um, but still, uh, I had to always laugh at Mr. Miller. How it was always, he always made it cloudy for me. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll move into number seven, executive session. Motion to adjourn the executive session in accordance with section 121.22 of the ORC. So moved. Moved by Mr. Bob Myers. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Mr. Bob Myers. Mr. Bob Myers. Bob Myers. Bob Myers. <laughs> Mrs. Roberts. Okay, sorry. I have a second by Mr. Bob Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Bob. Yes. Mr. Smeltzer. Yes. Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Hoffman. Yes. Mr. Kimmer. Yes. Motion passes. All of you, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, no action. Did no action. I don't expect this to be too long either. So.
the back Check on the screen for the whole two people that are watching, which is probably <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> We are back from the <laughs> session out at 10.02. And move into number eight. Uh, yeah. uh, of course, though. Yeah. Moves us to number eight closing items. Reminders, uh, next meeting will be Monday, June 8th, 7 o'clock here in the district office. Now that moves us into 8.2 adjournments. And then Ms. Roberts had a few technical difficulties, oh. so I'll take roll real quick. Okay. And uh, um, so, Dina, a motion. Moved by Mr. Boat. Second. Second, Mr. President. Second by Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Boat. Yes. Mr. Kilmer. Yes. Mr. Schrock. Yes. Mr. Myers. Yes. Mr. Smelson. Yes. We are adjourned. <laughs>